Hello everyone. I was on vacation the last two weeks, but I am finally back and ready to continue on with the story of Irredeemable. For those of you curious, I will talk about my vacation a little bit. But for those of you who don't care and just want to get to Irredeemable, feel free to fast forward a little bit. So I went to Scotland for my friend's wedding. I was the best man and the wedding went really well. And then I explored a little bit of Scotland, saw a whole bunch of sheep everywhere. I went to the city of Glasgow, which was really cool. There was a soccer game one afternoon and everyone was plastered drunk in the middle of the day. So that was uh, interesting to see. I went to Edinburgh and I saw the castle there, which was really cool. That's like their big tourist attraction there. And the castle had cannons and everything. And it was on the top of a big hill overlooking the city. Uh, totally worth seeing. Then I went to London and I did all these stereotypical tourist stuff you do there. Rode the double-decker bus, saw Big Ben, Parliament, the Tower of London, the London Eye, you know, the big Ferris wheel thing. So that was all great. London really impressed me. It is such a busy, happening city, and it has all these historical buildings around to look at. So I really enjoyed uh, exploring. One thing interesting about uh, the UK is Tim Hortons there. I'm a Canadian, and we have Tim Hortons. And it pretty much just sells, you know, coffee, donuts, and sandwiches. But in the UK, Tim Hortons sells hamburgers and fried chicken sandwiches and has pancakes. And I was just like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> uh, that is not what Tim Hortons is in Canada, the birthplace of Tim Hortons. But I guess in the UK and the US, uh, Tim Hortons is uh, basically uh, really shitty fast food. So uh, really interesting to see. Afterwards, I went to Paris. Uh, I went up the Eiffel Tower, which was pretty cool, and I think it was worth doing. I liked seeing what was up there and seeing the city. I thought it was totally worth it. And then I went to the Louvre Museum, and that was also really cool. That was probably the best museum I've ever seen in my life. Although, I will say, the Mona Lisa is the big attraction in that museum, and there was a massive line to see it, and you know, it is considered probably the most famous painting in the world, and I gotta say, it's kind of a piece of shit. It's super small, and it is totally not worth seeing, really. But uh, the rest of that, that museum was really impressive. Seeing all the decked out walls and ceilings was really something to see. So anyway, that was uh, roughly my trip in Europe over the last two weeks. Anyway, let's talk about Irredeemable Volume 5. Last volume, the Paradigm and Plutonian were in this huge fight, and the Paradigm were going to kill Plutonian with this magic candle wax bullet, which will make him mortal for a few moments. But Cubit, he used his teleportation technology to redirect that magic bullet and kill Orion the demon with it and leave Plutonian alive. And now in this volume, we will see the repercussions of that. This volume, volume 5, I think, is one of the best volumes in the entire series. Lots of stuff goes down, and it also has one of the most ridiculous, funny moments in the entire series involving a Snickers bar. It is so ridiculous, and I am going to love to talk about that moment with you all. All right, let's dive into the story for Irredeemable, volume 5. Irredeemable Volume 5, written by Mark Wade, art by Peter Kraus. Issue 16. Gilgamos, feeling betrayed by his wife Bette Noir's infidelity, needs some time on his own to reflect. He strikes out and wanders America aimlessly. Gilgamos, now without wings, can no longer fly. He contemplates booking a flight with one of the airlines that still operates in America. I guess most of them shut down when Plutonian destroyed a lot of the country. But Gilgamos, he wasn't even sure how to book a flight. He's never had to before because he's always had his wings. Kerry, he walks right into one of the US military bases. Soldiers are shooting at him, but the bullets do nothing. With Kerry's power, he can just deflect them. Kerry. He marches right up to General Ehrlich, who is now the acting president of the United States. And he asks Ehrlich 
where his brother Scylla's body is, as Carrie assumes the US government were the ones that took him. The general says he has no idea what Carrie is talking about. Carrie gets angry and yells, Don't you lie to me! The general says, I wasn't even aware that Scylla was dead. My condolences for your loss. Carrie, he is still angry with the general, rightfully so, because the general was the one that sicked Orion the demon on them. Also, he was the one responsible for arresting the Paradigm members a few volumes ago. Well, Orion is dead now and the Paradigm are free. Carrie tells General Ehrlich, you're going to wish it was me that was dead and not my brother. For instance, these? The controls to America's remaining nuclear arsenal? Carrie, he then destroys those controls and he tells the general, they're going to take at least a year to rebuild. Until then, my team and I are your nuclear arsenal. Treat us with respect. Elsewhere, Cubit and Caden are at Bolt's grave, and they are talking about their dead friend. Cubit tells Caden to tell him everything she remembers about Bolt, and she does. And then Cubit tells her to tell him about all their other fallen comrades, such as Metal Man, Citadel, Gazer, various fallen members of the Paradigm. Caden, she does so. She tells stories about all the various members of their team. And then Cubit smiles. He tells Caden to turn around and says to her, Our odds of surviving this may be better than you suspect. Just how powerful are you, Caden? Caden, she has the power to summon spirits of Japanese legends by telling stories of them. Well, it appears that that power can also be used to summon the spirits of their fallen teammates as well. Because they are warriors too, after all. Elsewhere. Modius Samsara gets in the way of an oncoming car, and the driver of the car swerves out of the way and crashes and flips his car over. The man's wife and kids inside the car are trapped in there. The man, he begs Samsara to help him get the door of the car open and get his family free before they are engulfed in the flames of the car. Modius Samsara refuses though. Plutonian, he flies over and arrives, and with his breath, he puts out the fire on the car. But it is too late, the man's wife and child are dead. The man begs Plutonian, I didn't mean to do this! I just took my eyes off the road for a second, and then this happened! Oh, oh god, do something, please, tell me this isn't happening! What, what have I done? Take this back! Tell me this didn't happen, please, god! Plutonian asks the man, what if I told you I could undo it? And the man stares at Plutonian, hopeful. Plutonian tells the man, Would that allow you to forgive yourself if I could reverse the clock and give you a second chance? If I could use my powers to reverse time just this once? And the man, he begs, he says, Yes, yes, please. Plutonian tells him, Well, I can't. This is what happens when you make one mistake. There's no forgiveness. Later on, Modius Samsara and Plutonian are talking, and Modius Samsara asks Plutonian, what does he want? He says, I've been thinking about how to make everything right again for you, and it's obvious to me that Sky City was the real breaking point for you, the irreversible moment, so what if I told you I could undo that? And Plutonian looks at him, wondering how that could be possible. Issue 17 Over in Iowa, Cubit is putting his brains and technology skills to work to help the people there rebuild. He is creating solar-powered tractors so they can farm and grow food. Some of the farmers question Cubit. Why didn't they stop Plutonian? Cubit answers, I wish I had a better answer than we tried. We were as surprised as you, I promise. That's not much comfort, but I'd rather be honest than whine for a forgiveness that we're going to have to earn anyway. I hope you'll consider this a first step and not just bludgeon me to death because we have work to do. 
The farmers accept Cubit's answers for now and get back to work, and they appreciate Cubit's help rebuilding. But then Carrie arrives a short time later. Carrie is still upset at the whole Cubit saving Plutonian's life thing and killing Orion instead. So Carrie riles up the townspeople and tells them, We had our chance to kill Plutonian a few days ago. A clean shot. He was at our mercy and Cubit saved him. Why don't you explain to the people why you did that, Cubit? Because I have no idea. Elsewhere, Kanan, now realizing that she can summon the spirits of their dead friends, tries to summon Scylla, but she can't. She can't summon his spirit. And the reason she can't is because Scylla must still be alive. Kaden, with this revelation, jumps up excited and says, Carrie, Cubit, are you there? It's Scylla. Wherever he is, he's alive. Elsewhere, we see Scylla. He is brain dead, but his living body is in possession of Cubit's rogue Modius android robot, along with Encanta as well. Elsewhere, Modius Samsara and Plutonian are together. Modius Samsara shows Plutonian the lost sapphire of Ishwar, the sapphire that Plutonian retrieved for Samsara a while back. It is the sister gem to the one that is in Samsara's forehead. Samsara's gem has regenerative powers. Well, Modius Samsara convinces Plutonian that if they find a way to create enough power to trigger the sapphire, then the restorative magic inside the sapphire can bring back all the people in Sky City that died. They can bring them all back to life, kind of reverse everything. Well, this is certainly an interesting development to Plutonian. Back over to Cubit and Carrie. The townsfolk, now riled up by Carrie, are beating up Cubit for saving Plutonian's life. One of the people punching Cubit says, My wife is dead. Plutonian murdered 9 million people. Are you insane? He won't stop. Carrie, he is just sitting back watching this, loving it. But he finally creates a force field around Cubit and says, I think you've made the point that I clearly haven't been able to effectively make. Cubit and Carrie then start arguing. Cubit tells Carrie, listen, listen to me. It's not that simple. There's so much to figure out. So much more going on. How can Sam Sarah be back to life? Where is Encanta? She's no longer where I left her. Where's Tony? What happened to your brother? Carrie questions Cubit. How many people will Tony murder today? What is it, Cubit? It's not like a moral line you won't cross. You killed Orion and you didn't even hesitate. Cubit tells Carrie, You have no idea what was in my thoughts, Carrie. Do you ever wonder why I work so hard to make sure there's always another option for... for Caden, for Bet, for Gilgamos, for you? I find a way. That's my role. I always find a way. And I don't do it out of mercy for the bad guys. I do it for you, because killing someone changes you. Carrie asks him, how do you know? Cubit answers, because I just did it. Orion was an alien demon who was seconds away from summoning an invading army to conquer the Earth. There was nothing in him but blackness. We owed him nothing, Carrie, but we owe Tony everything. He saved this planet and everyone on it a hundred times over. We have to try just a little while longer. Carrie and Cubit, they go back and forth some more and argue some more, but eventually it comes down to this. Should they have killed Plutonian or not? And Cubit argues, we do not have to kill him. But Carrie pushes Cubit. How can he be so sure about that? And then Cubit lets slip something about their old teammate Hornet. And Cubit says, Hornet proved it to me when he died. And Carrie puzzled asks, what Cubit means by that? And for the answer to that, we will have to wait till next issue.
back over to Plutonian and Modia Samsara. They go over to Sky City. Plutonian has the sapphire in his hands, and he begins using his heat vision to focus his energy onto the sapphire. If he expels enough energy, perhaps he can bring everyone back to life. When Plutonian finishes, though, it doesn't look like anything happened. No one came back to life. Plutonian then talks about Modius. He tells Samsara, I put out enough heat energy to fission the nitrogen molecules in the air and nothing happened. I don't know what it's going to take. Tell ya who could have figured it out if he hadn't vanished years ago. Only man more intelligent than Cubit. Modius. You didn't really know Modius, Sam. I kept you from him at as best I could for, for your own safety. Now, of course, remember, while Plutonian is talking to Samsara right now, Modius is actually inside Samsara and is hearing all of this conversation. Plutonian continues talking, he says, Unlike everyone else I ever fought, Modius was impossible to stop because his motives were an internal enigma. What was maddening to me was that I had no clue what he wanted. He didn't rob banks. He didn't seize thrones. He simply attacked, murdering anyone who ever challenged him. Anyone but me. Our relationship was unique. He saved all his torment for me. He was forever inventing ways to torture me, strike at me through everything or everyone I cared about. Like killing me was too easy for him. We had no shared history. We knew each other only as bitter enemies. I'd demand to know why he hated me so singularly, and he'd just stare. I never understood him. Until one day. Plutonian then describes this one particular day where he broke into one of Modius's labs, and Modius had created a whole bunch of cybernetic duplicates of Plutonian. And Plutonian wonder, why did Modius create these? Samsara answers, probably to fight you. Plutonian explains that he can do far more than just listen to heartbeats. He can watch electrons bounce through a man's subcortex and interpret their dance as anxiety or elation or rage. And when Plutonian looked at Modius that day, and watched the electrons in Modius's brain dance, he was able to read Modius's true feelings and thoughts at that time. The robot duplicates that Modius built weren't for instruments of crime, they were sex robots. Plutonian says Modius was in love with me. Modius Samsara to this says, that's not, that's not true. He didn't love you, he hated you. Plutonian explains, he did both. No thinner boundary on the human map. He'd hurt me, but I was the one he'd never kill. The one whose attention he demanded, to the point where he destroyed anything that might compete for it. My guess would be that his emotionally twisted mind never had the tools to express it except through rage. Or maybe he hated himself so much that it overran me, but he loved me. He loved me so much that he eventually found a way to disappear from this earth altogether so he could be with me always and forever inside the reanimated corpse of my sidekick. Plutonian then stares at Modius Samsara with his evil glowy eyes. Plutonian has figured Modius out. Oh, shit. Issue 18 Carrie, Caden, and Cubit are all together, and Cubit tells them all about their fallen paradigm member, the Hornet. When Hornet died, he sent Cubit a video recording he made in case of his untimely death, and there were instructions for Cubit to only watch the video outside of Earth space so Plutonian couldn't hear it. Cubit, he plays the video recording of Hornet now that was recorded six weeks 
before Plutonian went rogue. On the recording, Hornet says, Cubit, I don't know how to cushion this part, so I'll just say it. If you're listening to this, it means the Plutonian finally snapped. It means my best friend just murdered me. He'd snapped like I was always afraid he would. And now he's coming after you and the rest of the paradigm. You're being stalked and hunted by an almighty enemy. The Hornet then explains when he first became suspicious of Plutonian. It was one day when they were back at Paradigm headquarters and they were all playing poker. No one would dare assume that Plutonian would cheat at poker. But while they were having friendly conversation, Plutonian innocently asked Hornet, Hey, uh, when does Donna get back? Donna is the name of Hornet's wife. She must have been out of town for a bit, and perhaps Hornet mentioned she was out of town in past conversation. But Hornet was suspicious because he never once mentioned his wife's name. He talked about her and the kids, sure, but he never mentioned her name. Why would Plutonian know his wife's name? So Hornet became suspicious of Plutonian and started worrying that Maybe Plutonian's Boy Scout thing was just all a facade. Now and then, when Plutonian thinks no one was looking, he would notice little flinches across expression on Plutonian, a bitter sigh. And every time, Hornet would hold his breath and pray the pin slides back into the grenade. Because if it didn't, the world was defenseless. We will continue on with Hornet's explanations in a bit. But for now, we jump back over to Plutonian and Modius Samsara. Modius Samsara asks Plutonian, When did he know? When did he figure it out? Plutonian answers, Early on, honestly. There is a very characteristic emotionless to your tone. Your speech patterns, very unique, very familiar. Plus, Samsara couldn't heal from the kind of wound I gave him. And if he did, he definitely couldn't think as clearly as you do. At first, I thought you were just being cruel, messing with me, leading me around by the nose through a life of failure and disappointment. Modia Samsara, now sweating, says, No, no, that wasn't what he was doing. But Plutonian tells him, No, I realize that now. This wasn't about hurt or revenge. You wanted to show me that you're my constant. The one I can still turn to no matter how much I hurt, yes? That was it. I know. I wish you'd come out earlier. It's cost us so much time. Modius says, I was so afraid. Plutonian tells him, you don't have to be afraid now. Were you worried that I'd react out of revenge? How could I? My god, Modius, look at yourself. You found the perfect vessel. I can never look at that face and feel anything but love for you. So long as all I can see is the face of my best friend? So let's fix that. Plutonian then uses his eye beams and burns off Samsara's face. And Modius Samsara then runs off screaming in pain. (laughs) And then this next part is funny but weird. Plutonian, moments after burning off Samsara's face, his best friend, he finds a Snickers bar in the wreckage. I'm not making this up. This is in the story. He finds a Snickers bar in the wreckage, and he eats it. And it's like a scene out of a deranged advertisement, because you're not you when you're hungry. (laughs) This scene is ridiculous, but it is some very interesting dark humor to just insert into this series. He just burned off his friend's face, and then he eats a Snickers bar. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Is this a dumb throwaway joke? Is this stupid and should not have been in the book at all? Or is this the most genius writing you've ever seen in a comic ever? Let me know. Anyway, let's continue on with the story. Back over to Hornet. Hornet explains his big heroic moment. There was a time in the past where the Paradigm were fighting off an alien invasion of a group of aliens called the Vespa. The Vespa aliens were cleaning the Paradigm's clocks. The Vespa, they studied. They knew Earth's key soldiers, what their powers were. Even with Plutonian's help, 
It was dire. The Vespa were destroying. Hornet, though, he came up with a plan. He said that the aliens, they don't care about him. He has no powers. He's barely a threat. They don't even really pay attention to him. So Hornet asks for Cubit's teleportation device and says he will sneak into the alien's ship and do some reconnaissance, look for weaknesses. Plutonian, even with all of his powers, he can't see through the Vespa's ship, can't see inside. So Cubit, he agreed to the plan. Hornet, he teleported into the Vespa's ship and he looks around. And the Vespa aliens there were not messing about. They had many more Vespa soldiers ready to join the invasion of Earth. The Vespa aliens quickly captured and subdued Hornet. And they placed a universal translator device in Hornet's ear. And they talked with him. And they paraded Hornet in front of the Vespa leader. So they could give Hornet a message to deliver to the others. The Vespa leader told Hornet, star travel was new to them. Earth was the first environmentally adequate planet they'd found. They'd already killed hundreds, and that was only a start. The alien leader made it abundantly clear to Hornet that his soldiers would stop at absolutely nothing to overrun it for their needs. In fact, the alien leader took great pleasure in describing the noise that human children made when Vespans laid eggs down their throats. The alien leader said he was well aware that there would be many casualties in this war on both sides, but ultimately the Vespa would be victorious, even if it took them generations. Well, Hornet, he jumps in and says, what if I were to make you a better offer? Even if we win, that won't save us because you and we have a common enemy, Plutonian. The Vespin leader says, I do not understand. He fights alongside you. Hornet explains, for now, maybe, but not forever. You have the power to subjugate him, but we on Earth do not. You're right to be confused. He is an ally for now. But provided he ever turns against us, and I believe he will, I want you to intercede to save us. The alien leaders to save you, save you? Humans often attempt to bargain when they have nothing to offer. Hornet to this says nothing. Look at the size of this ship. How much time did it take to build? How many of your planet's resources did you exhaust just to fuel it? Here is what I have to bargain with. Teleportation. Hornet, he holds out Cubit's teleportation device. The alien leader is intrigued by it, but says, Now that we're already here on Earth, we have no use for this. Hornet tells the aliens, You need to extend your empire. We have been to dozens of Earth-like alien planets, worlds without, without defenses. If you vow to return, to take Plutonian when I say so, and I guarantee you will meet no resistance, if you keep Earth safe, I will provide you exact transport coordinates to every world we have ever visited and ever will. Do we have a deal? The alien leaders accept Hornet's deal, and they bow before him. Hornet. He then left the alien ship and walked outside and was seen as a hero. He did what the others could not. He saved the world. He negotiated with the Vespa and got them to leave. When Plutonian and the others asked how Hornet did it, how he got the aliens to leave, Hornet, he just laughed and said, How? I'm a badass. That's how. Ever since then, though, this is what Hornet has been doing. He's been feeding the aliens information, selling the universe to protect the human race, feeding star map data every so often into the transmitter that the Vespa left for him. The Vespa, they didn't even bother to return the messages. Maybe they're afraid Plutonian will overhear. Or maybe they all died years ago. Hornet doesn't know. Who knows? 
Hornet ends his message by saying, That was three years ago, and now, every day that Tony doesn't go insane, I get to wonder if I'm a hero or just a paranoid little man. But again, if you're hearing this, at least it means I wasn't paranoid, just dead. I'm sure you're livid, Cubit, but I'm begging you, let this be our secret. Don't tell the others, please. Let me just be a hero. Hornet at some point arranged for an alert to be triggered upon his death, which would put some plans into motion for the Vespa aliens to return for their part of the bargain and take Plutonian away. Cubit has a device on his watch that starts going off. He tells Caden and Carrie that it's a proximity sensor. The Vespa are here. Back to Plutonian. After finishing his oh-so-delicious Snickers bar, he gets blasted by one of the Vespa aliens that have arrived on Earth through the teleportation technology that Hornet gave them. The Vespa aliens are standing over Plutonian, and they are here to take him away. Issue 19 The Vespa aliens are attacking Plutonian. They have weaponized Cubit's teleportation technology, and whenever Plutonian tries to hit them, they deflect the incoming attacks into a teleportation portal. The Vespa then use concentrated teleportation beams to remove invulnerable molecules on Plutonian's body that they otherwise wouldn't be able to cut. Plutonian can't actually beat these aliens. He is outmatched. Elsewhere, Modius Samsara's face is all melted. The Modius android, along with Scylla and Encanta, teleport over to Modius Samsara. And the Modius android, with the help of Encanta, reabsorbs Modius's essence out of Samsara and into the android body. Modius Android comments, Ooh, much better. So the real Modius has jumped out of Samsara and is now in the body of the robot android. Back over to the Vespa fighting Plutonian. They are firing at him with their weapons and trying to subdue him. Cubit, Caden, and Carrie, wearing universal translators, teleport over to the Vespa on the battlefield. Cubit, he talks with the Vespa and he says that they know about the Vespa's bargain with Hornet. But Cubit asks, how can Earth be assured that the Vespa won't turn on the planet once they've held up their end of the bargain? The Vespa replies that they are beings of honor. They will abide by their initial agreement. We see Plutonian. He is getting all super accelerated. He appears to kill a whole bunch of the Vespa, punching their heads clean off. Carrie tries to hold down Plutonian. Caden summons some spirits to also attack Plutonian. The Vespa have generated a straitjacket to trap Plutonian in that is actually made of Plutonian's own DNA cloned skin. It seems all over for the Plutonian. But then, somehow, miraculously, he bursts out of the straitjacket they put him in, and he tries to retreat. Plutonian then notices the gem that Modius Samsara told him he could use to bring everyone back to life in Sky City. Plutonian, he grabs that gem and flies high into the air. Plutonian, he says, I can make it right. Plutonian, he uses his heat vision and blasts the gem with such energy that like a miracle, Everyone in Sky City comes back to life. And Plutonian, he flies back down and he tells the people to not be afraid. What happened here wasn't supposed to. He says it wasn't what you think. He can help. Plutonian tells them, I'll make it right if you just trust me, please. Plutonian then holds the hand of a little girl and the little girl says, thank you. Now, this seems a little bit too good to be true. That is because it is. This is just an artificial dream. In actuality, Plutonian never escaped that straitjacket. 
The Vespa have captured him and are transporting him off-world. And these visions of him bringing everyone in Sky City back to life was nothing more than an artificial reality fantasy. The Vespa have put Plutonian under to keep him subdued. And with Plutonian being taken away by the Vespa, this is the end of Volume 5. All right, that was Volume 5 of Irredeemable. Let me go through my thoughts on this volume and why I think it is one of the best in the series. So we had to reveal in this volume that Modius is actually in love with Plutonian. Sexually, maybe, or just some sort of deeper connection love. But he is in love with him, and I think that is a very interesting twist and an interesting explanation for why he is so obsessed with Plutonian over the years. It reminds me of Batman and the Joker and their relationship. And the Joker, he in a way kind of loves Batman. You know, he loves to hate him or he can't be without him. That's something that's sort of explored a little bit in Batman comics, but it is explored really more directly in Irredeemable. And uh, I think it is a great twist there. Now, Plutonian he sort of lasered off Sam Sarah's face, and I thought that was really cool. And then, of course, we have that big Snickers bar moment where Plutonian eats the Snickers bar after lasering off the face of his friend, which I think is so ridiculous, but I love it. I love how dark it is and twisted and weird and funny. And uh, yeah, it is such an interesting moment. So uh, I'm all about it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I want to know what you guys thought of that moment. Um, I also liked the twist with Hornet in this volume, how Hornet really planned this whole thing. He made this deal with the Vespa, gave them teleportation technology because he thought that Plutonian was really secretly maybe a bad guy and he wanted a way to deal with it for humanity. So I thought all that was really cool. And then when the Vespa arrive, they successfully kind of subdue Plutonian and take him down. I also think it's really cool how Plutonian is kind of in this uh, dream state now, and he's living in this fantasy world so that the Vespins can sort of keep him calm and subdued. So that was all some great twist stuff going on. And uh, yeah, for all those reasons, I think this is probably the best volume of Irredeemable, and I'm going to give this one a 9.5 out of 10. Great stuff. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with Volume 6.